part. So it's a pleasure to welcome Sasha Wolberg, who will talk about a solution of NFLOS problem. Well, thank you very much. So it's um, a recent result obtained with my former student, uh, Pata Ivanishvili, and um, uh, with Ramon Van Handel, with whom we shared the office at MSRI and started to discuss something which um, finally came to the solution. What we started to discuss, I will explain later, it has nothing to do with the flaws problem. Uh, so, so here is what I would like to, to talk. It's, it's, it's called a RIBE program. And it was like popularized by many people whom you see here, Borgain, Naor, Linden Strauss, and Flo Pizier, Schechtman, many others. And um, very roughly, you can say uh, this program uh, sounds like that. Do we really need linearity in the Banach space theory? So uh, the very good point to start is Bourguin discretization theory. So let's suppose we have um, a metric spaces, as you can see, x, dx, and y, dy, and a certain number. Uh, and we say that x embeds into y with distortion d if there exists a map uh, which satisfies this condition with a certain positive s. Uh, and the smallest d, of course, is called embedding constant. And it's denoted by this symbol. Um, so if uh, Y or X are linear spaces, then you can forget about this S and think that S is just one. And then if one of them is linear, this distortion embedding can be just formulated like that. Whether you have such a map from X to Y and you try to find the best D the smallest. Uh, now, recently, the, the distortion of, of embedding of metric spaces into other metric spaces uh, became quite important because of big data theory. And it's more or less clear why, because you need to embed a big cloud of points in very high dimensional space with small distortion to low dimensional space. So, um, so that's uh, clear that there is an uh, interesting connection with applied mathematics. Um, and now let me come to this Bourguin discretization theorem. Let me first explain what this constant delta means. Uh, so given X and Y and uh, X, let it be just n dimensional linear norm space, Y Banach space, then this constant delta, uh, it's the largest number such that if every delta net in the unit ball of X um, uh, can be embedded into Y with K distortion, then there exists a linear map of X into Y such that it can be embedded X to Y with say 2K distortion. So if you have an embedding of, of nets, of discrete sets, then you have a linear embedding, uh, and maybe with same distortion or a little bit bigger. It's uh, 2K, two is not very important here. So you started with K, you finished with 2K. Uh, so the question, I mean, definition is very strange because maybe such delta doesn't exist. So it, it may be for some X and Y it does exist, for some it doesn't exist. Well, the Bourguin discretization theorem is an amazing result, which says that it does exist for every X and Y, and it doesn't depend on geometry of X and Y. Okay, so it depends only on dimension. So here is Bourguin's theorem. So if we have n dimensional norm space and any Banach space, doesn't matter what is geometry. Um, then there exists a linear map from X to Y that realizes the following inequality. So if you have on, on your delta, um, on, on all delta nets, a certain uh, distortion, this is this number bigger than one, which is called distortion, then you can have a linear map with almost the same distortion. 
And for that, you need just to take delta equals this. So not depending on any geometry at all. Okay, so let me illustrate it by the picture. So this is a, like n dimensional x. This is a big dimensional y. And here is uh, one of the delta nets. You should check it for every delta net. And uh, suppose you have some embedding, some, absolutely not linear, with a certain fixed distortion, but it's for every delta net. So then you can linearize it. Then you can construct another map, which is here written in red. So this is red arrow which will be linear and almost with the same distortion. So what, what are strange corollaries of this result? Uh, so let X be a finite dimensional Lorentz space and, and Y is a Banach space. And suppose we have a bi Lipschitz map, uh, not bi Lipschitz, just a Lipschitz map from X and y to Y. Uh, with certain distortion D, then you can linearize it. Then there exists a linear embedding from X to Y with distortion at most 2D, actually just 1.1 D. So you can always linearize any Lipschitz uh, uh, embedding. You see nothing depends on N. Uh, so the proof is just immediate corollary of uh, Bourguin discretization theorem. Well, we, we have already Lipschitz map, so choose any, any net. It will be distorted independent of the net because there is a Lipschitz map which embeds. And then it means that there exists a linear map with almost the same distortion. So it's uh, any Lipschitz thing can be linearized. Um, but there was a fixed uh, dimension. So nothing depended on dimension, but there was a fixed di finite dimension. So famous problem. You're not saying anything about relation of this linear map to the Lipschitz maps. So somehow is it close or what is? No, it doesn't say that, but of course it's constructed using this Lipschitz maps. Yeah. This Lipschitz map, right. So the famous problem, which is open, are any two by Lipschitz equivalent Banach spaces are actually linear isomorphic. So it's like sort of discretization, but with N now not, not finite. And the funny, st strange thing about this theorem that N is finite, but it doesn't matter what finite. Okay. Well, a little bit more about history. So it's an old result. Kadets proved that any two separable Banach spaces are actually homeomorphic. Uh, so some result between this open problem and this Kadets result, uh, if we have two uniformly homeomorphic Banach spaces, I will say what is uniformly homeomorphic. Um, then they can be not linearly isomorphic. So about Lipschitz, it's unknown, but um, uh, uh, about uniformly homeomorphic, it's known that it, they can be not linearly isomorphic. Uh, but if one of them is just the space LP, then there is linearly isomorphic. Now here is the definition, non-linear space, uh, spaces are uniformly homeomorphic, well, trivial definition, you, you should have homeomorphism, uh, invertible thing, which is uniformly continuous. That, that's it. So on, on, on the level of formulas, there is a certain lemma which says that this is equivalent because these guys are Banach spaces. This is equivalent to this inequality. That there, is, there is some map F, which has this, uh, uh, this thing. And uh, the only difference here with uh, Lipschitzness is uh, this assumption uh, before the implication. So it's like quasi-isometry. Yeah, so if, if there wouldn't be this assumption, it's just Lipschitz thing, but with this assumption is, it's a um, certain course and Klee lemma says that it's the same as uniformly homeomorphic. Then 
at the, I think, end of 70s, there was this um, very interesting theorem, which is, which is why this program is called Ribe program. So Swedish mathematician Martin Ribe proved that if two Banach spaces X and Y are uniformly homomorphic, so in particular, if they are uh, uh, Lipschitz uh, homomorphic, then there exists some finite number D such that for any N and any linear subspace of X, uh, there is a linear map with distortion at most D. So as soon as they, they're uniformly homeomorphic and you consider mm, slice of one of the spaces of them, any finite dimension, it can be uh, embed uh, uh, with, with, with the same distortion into, into Y and vice versa because it's symmetric. So it's like on the level of small dimension, not any dimension, any finite dimension, these are the same spaces linearly but not necessarily globally. So this is like a local property of Banach spaces, right? So local properties of Banach spaces are preserved under uniformly homeomorphic maps. In particular, they are preserved under Lipschitz, by Lipschitz maps. So local property are, do not know anything about Lipschitz, not Lipschitz, it doesn't matter for them. As soon as Lipschitz, they are linear. So it, it means something, right? It means that there is some hidden mechanism inside the Banach space, which translates linear properties into metric properties and vice versa. And to find this formulation is called the Ribe program. So why is that? So let's formulate something um, uh, 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 homeomorphically um, uh, independent. So le 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 let's see an example. So, for example, here is Martin Ribe corollary X and Y, two Banach spaces that are Bilipschitz equivalent, then they have the same type P. So it's a theorem of the end of 70s. So, what does it mean, type? So, for Banach spaces, type is a certain number, P. It's the number between one and two, and it's always bigger than one and always less or equal than two. Nothing else can happen with the type. And it's, uh, it's this thing. So um, you, the Banach space is called of type P if the following inequality uh, happens. So let's read this inequality. So first of all, there should be universal constant C Secondly, nothing should depend on how many vectors you, you take. So these are vectors in the Banach space. Uh, so here, these vectors are in norm in Banach space to the power P. Here's the sum, it's clear. What is on the left? You just put here a random science. So Rademacher random variables with equal probability one half uh, being plus one or minus one. And then you average, so just take expectation. And if to the power P it's less than the right-hand side, then the space is called uh, of type P. So it's, it turns out to be one of the fundamental notion of uh, theory of Banach spaces. So this type, there is also cotype, which maybe we'll see later, but cotype is something sort of, I can say what is cotype, it's this inequality, but in the opposite direction, but it, at this moment, it doesn't matter. So, um, so here is the type, and every Banach space has type one. Uh, this is why P is bigger than one, because type one is nothing. It's triviality. It's triangle inequality. So you just put norm inside, and you get type one. So th that's not a property. Forget about it. So. Type can be only bigger, it's called non-trivial type. P is bigger than one, less or equal than two. And the best type, of course, two, but any, any, any non-trivial type is interesting. Uh, and so this is what uh, Martin Reeb proved that if, of course, type is, is linear invariant, right? If, if there is isomorphic, it's one has type P, another also has type P. 
what, what he proved is that you don't need linear. If they are Lipschitz isomorphic, they still have the same type. And, and here is, it's kind of uh, highlights what is the Bourguin wanted from Ribe program. Okay, here is the Martin Ribe theorem. If they are by Lipschitz homeomorphic, they have the same type. Please. What are, Sash, what are examples of Banach spaces of type P? LP. Well, just below P below two. Uh, even better, if, if P below two, then you understand that type will be exactly P. But if P is bigger than two, but less than infinity, the type will be exactly two. Okay. So, so this is what Bourguin wanted. He wanted for each such property, for example, for this type P, what, what is the metric property of the Banach space, which is responsible for that? Because this theorem is, has nothing to do with mechanism. It just says that it's true, but what is the property? which is preserved, uh, which, which allows us to prove that. So it cannot be linear property. Type is a linear property. So it should be some nonlinear property. Let's temporarily call it metric type. And then what we need for this particular case is to prove that metric type and linear type are the same. But what is the metric type? So let's see. So, but in this uh, theorem by Ribe, by Ripe or Ribe, Ribe, yeah, it's assumed that both have type. Well, and then the types are the same, or it is assumed. What is no, it? No, no, no. It says that as soon as they are uh, by Lipschitz equivalent, and if one of them has a type P, another will have type P. Same. So, what what would be an example of a space without any type? As I said, space without any type. Uh, L infinity. Okay, so I continue. So what is the secret metric mechanism that exists and allows the type to be preserved under by Lipschitz map? Um, so here I says that Ribes theorem is very interesting, but it doesn't give this mechanism. And uh, here I explain why finding this mechanism can be important. So finding this hidden thing, which we don't understand at this moment, we just suspect that it should exist. Uh, first of all, it makes possible to extend these notions to more general metric spaces, not necessarily to, to Banach spaces. Uh, and it makes also possible to study embedding in Banach spaces of general metric spaces, which is quite important as I explained in, in the data, theoretical data science. And so Bourguin initiated a program to find explicit description of local properties of Banach spaces. But in the case of the type, this local property was formulated. It was formulated in 19, 69 or 70 by parent floor. Uh, and it got name uh, and floor type. So uh, for that, I need to explain what is uh, embedding of the humming cube into the Banach space. So uh, humming cube is just this very simple object. It's discrete cube, it's vertices of the cube in, in Rn. So just strings of symbols consisting of minus one and one of length n. And we can think that you can integrate on this thing because, uh, well, you, you just uh, have, you think about them as uh, this each minus one, one, each coordinate is a random variable, just rather much a random variable. And you have this uh, measure, uh, which is probability. So it's very trivial. So it's just product of measures. And so this is the integration over the humming cube. There is also differentiation, by the way, because you can differentiate with respect to every variable, get others frozen and just subtract 
the place where function where it's plus one minus function where it's minus one divide by two it's it's discrete derivative okay uh, so let us consider such such object it's it's um, uh, it's an object on humming cube because you can think about epsilon as coordinates right for every string of this epsilon you will have some some Banach space point because uh, x's are uh, now vectors in the Banach space so it's a, a linear polynomial on humming cube or you can think about this as a certain special linear embedding of Hamming cube into the Banach space. So it's really like parallelogram, but its vertices are in the Banach space. Uh, uh, so, um, so the the type which I just introduced before is this inequality. So what for this linear polynomials on Hamming cube? So with Banach coefficients. So what it says here. So here it measures the distances of main diagonals from epsilon to minus epsilon, and the average over all possible main diagonals. Now here, if you have a point on the Hamming cube, you can flip one coordinate. So you go like along the edge. And on the right-hand side, you have the averages over all edges, or better to say sum of the averages over all edges, okay? And what just formulated before this linear type, it's called the Rademacher type, is this inequality for linear Fs with Banach coefficients, nothing else. It's exactly the same thing. Okay, and by the way, in this definition, already there is not so much linearity because this is the distance, right? You can write it in the in the in the metric space. This is the distance. That's the same as here. As you can write it in any metric space. You don't need linearity. The only place you use linearity is you said that this is applied to linear polynomials. Linear. So this is why I wrote there is almost no linearity, which is not true because it's, you should say that it's linear polynomials. And here is in flow type. So in flow type is you write exactly the same inequality, but now you don't say that F is linear. So F is any function on the Hamming cube, on this discrete cube. So it's any combination of epsilons then with Banach coefficients, then any combination of epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three times epsilon four polynomials of degree two, plus polynomials of degree three, plus polynomials of degree four, plus et cetera, et cetera. So all functions on Hamming cube are polynomials of very, very high degree because N is not uh, fixed. It should be true for every N. So, um, so this is what inflow type is. That, that's what definition of inflow or metric type. So um, just same inequality, but for all possible polynomials on Hamming cube, or if you wish for all possible functions. Um, so maybe I have a picture here. So here is a picture. So on the left here, we have like inflow type. You look all, all parallelograms in Banach space and then compare the lengths of uh, main diagonals to the power p to the length of all uh, uh, edges to the power p. And of course, everything is averaged. And on the right, you have inflow type. What does it mean inflow type? You consider not parallelogram uh, of high dimension, but any quadrilateral and lateral, whatever is, is it, like any Hamming cube with vertices in uh, uh, Banach space, and it can be very distorted. It, it, it shouldn't be parallel anyway. It's just, just some combinatorial thing which is enumerated by minus one and one of length n. And then you say, let's do the same thing. Let's compare the 
average of uh, pith power of main diagonals and average of pith power of all edges. And you ask whether <clears throat> if, if this inequality, one is controlled by the other is true for, for parallelogram things, when it is also true for these more general things. And this was in Floss problem. So in Floss problem was, is it true that Rademacher type P, linear type P, implies and flows type P. Well, in the opposite direction, it's obvious, right? Because this is just particular case of that, right? This is just particular case of that. So this is trivial, but in the opposite direction, it was this problem of, of and flow. And this problem of the, uh, this metric type of and flow beautifully generalizes to metric spaces, right? You just take any function on the Hamming cube with value in the metric spaces and you ask, uh, and you say by definition that this is metric type P. And so the question of inflow again can be formulated, uh, is, is it true that for Banach spaces, uh, metric type and linear type are the same? <clears throat> okay. So here I just, let me again emphasize the, this principle. I, I would like to call it linear to nonlinear principle. So yet another formulation, which I, I cannot have enough of it. So if you have a certain inequality for functions on Hamming cube, which are linear functions, then you have the same type of inequality for all functions. So that was the question of inflow for this particular uh, aggregate. And this sounds like idiotic, how it can be true. Something is true for linear polynomials, then it's true for all polynomials, regardless of the power. And however, it's true. So this is what we proved. And let me, yeah. So here's a theorem. So for any Banach space X, the best constant in and flow type, we, we fix P between one and two. So fix. Uh, and if it's, well, if it's infinite, nothing to prove, but if it's finite, if it's rather Macher type P, then it's in flow type P is only slightly bigger than rather Macher type. So here is a constant, it's uh, bigger than one, of course, but not much. Um, so this is, this is, well, this solution of inflows problem. Uh, so here I listed uh, the previous results. So, um, so as I said, he started to work with his uh, type in, in these years. He proved some very beautiful results, but he put this problem uh, in, in print in 1978. And, um, and he also proved a funny, very non-trivial result that if constant, so P is fixed, but there is also constant C. If constant is one, then it's the same. So for constant one, he proved it uh, in this 78. Well, there were some um, people who tried to prove it. Uh, there is a paper of Burgain, Milman, Wolfson that rather Macher type P implies and flow type P minus epsilon for every epsilon. But you cannot make epsilon zero in this proof because the constant blows up. Uh, then uh, there was a result of Schechtman uh, and Naor for so-called UMD spaces, the answer is yes. So they proved for this particular, UMD, I, I don't want to, to say what is it. It's a super important class of Banach spaces where sort of uh, almost all singular integral theory um, 
goes from scalar value to this UMD spaces. It's like special introduced by, Bur by Burkholder. It's just very interesting class of spaces. And they're characterized by the fact sort of that practically all harmonic analysis, usual harmonic analysis becomes UMD valued harmonic analysis. Well, yeah, I'm cheating a little bit, but it's okay. Uh, then there was a result of Hutton in our for a little bit more general thing, which nobody knows whether it's the same as UMD. Um, and then there were papers of Alexander Eskenazis, again, some other types of Banach spaces, again, but, well, yes, but not all. Um, and then there are many results of PZA, which I will, I will tell you about now. Uh, but again, the, the, it was not solved. Okay, so what if our functions, our polynomials, our linear polynomials with Banach space coefficients, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they are not from Rademacher variables. They are not the polynomials of epsilon, but they are polynomials of Gaussian independent guys. So then uh, Pizier proved this inequality. So it's a very general result with fantastic number of corollaries. And if these Gaussian variables, one would be able to replace them by Rademacher variables, it would immediately give the solution of inflows pro. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about PCA inequality because it has many interesting applications to um, um, random matrix theory to many other places. So uh, from this inequality, one can prove the following. So if you have any function from any Rn to any um, space of D by D symmetric matrices. And nothing will depend on N or D. Uh, and um, so then you will have this inequality for any function of these variables, independent of how many of them, what kind of polynomial is F, this F. It might not be even polynomial, but at least it should have derivatives. Uh, but let's think that it's a polynomial of degree, I don't know, 1,000 or, or 1 million. So nothing depends on degree, nothing depends on number of variables. You always have this inequality. Uh, why it's inequality is important? Because after very small work with it, you will have so-called concentration theorem for, for this uh, function in matrices. Uh, so it will show that uh, for Lipschitz functions of absolutely any number of variables to absolutely how big doesn't matter matrices, uh, you will have a certain fact uh, that uh, the um, basically they will be concentrated very close to the average, and uh, the tails will de will degree will um, uh, go to zero uh, super exponentially. So that's, of course, concentration of measure theorem, very important and follows from this year, practically immediately. If one uses, one, one, one needs one more block, one needs one more thing, why it's true for linear Fs. So for example, I don't know, G1, M1 plus G2, M2 plus G3, M3, et cetera, G, N, M, N, where M are matrices and Gs are independent, uh, uh, Gaussian. Why, why it's true for why why this thing is true for them? Well, it, it turns out that it's it has been known very long ago. It's called um, um, non-commutative Hinchin inequality, and it was proved by uh, this uh, professor Francois Louis Picard, my friend and remarkable mathematician. Um, so these two things together gives this concentration for matrices. Uh, why matrices? Let's take D equals one. 
So then and these are just scalar functions, scalar valid functions of Gaussian, Gaussian variables. And um, again, we have the same type of inequality, of course, because it's even easier, d equals one. Uh, and it gi gives us this Gaussian concentration, which, you know, people like Milman and uh, all, well, like they promote this concentration, measure concentration in many papers. Okay, so it's another example. Here is yet another example, uh, which follows from this um, Pizier inequality. So we take P equals one, functions are scalar, uh, but the number of G is absolutely arbitrary. It can be millions of uh, Gaussian variables. You can always have this uh, inequality. So you can notice that Poincaré inequality. So it's L1 Poincaré inequality and the constant is sharp. You cannot do better than this constant and actually the uh, function which gives uh, this constant, it's a sequence of functions which approximate half space in Rn. So G have values in Rn, they're Gaussian, but it's a vector which has values in Rn. And if you take by F a characteristic function of the half space, any half space in Rn, uh, it will give you sharp constant. Okay, so it's called Chigers Gaussian inequality. Uh, one more application. So here is a, a sort of um, non-commutative hinging inequality, but in operator norm, it's always more difficult. So here, everything depends on D because operator norm is, is a pretty bad norm. So for any number of Gaussian and any matrices symmetric in, a, in, a, in D by D matrices, one will have this inequality. So if you average uh, the linear polynomial, you will have this thing with some dependence on D because operator norm always kind of, it's worse than other norm. Um, so from, from here, from this linear thing, which is called Margulis inequality, you can immediately deduce that on the left-hand side, you shouldn't have linear. It can be any function in matrices uh, of any number of Gaussian variables. And then you get this inequality. And you see these guys, because they were, they were derivatives, right? If you, if you make derivative of this linear thing with respect to G, it's A. And then you take square of the derivative. So, well, for general function, you should, should do exactly the same. And notice the constant is basically the same. It only this pi over two jumps in. So it's, it's true always for any function of Gaussian variables. What was uh, the context in which Margulis dealt with such an inequality? Oh, Margulis has many interesting things about Hamming cube. I, I, I don't have time to, to, probably because of his work in this institute of ah. whatever information or how it's called. I see he was. <clears throat> his very important results. Okay, so, so that was Gaussian, th uh, Gaussian thing made by Pizier and uh, with many uh, applications. Um, and now let's try to change G to epsilon. So let's try to change Gaussian to Rademacher. So these are just guys which are plus minus one independent, there are many, many of them. And uh, the probability of plus or minus one is one half, one half. Okay, so Pizier proved this inequality. Pizier proved uh, Rademacher analog of his Gaussian inequality. The only thing what, 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 that was different that he got this estimate on the uh, constant. So the constant in Gaussian didn't depend on how many, how big is the Hamming cube. And he did depend, at least in the proof. 
Um, well, more or less recently, Hutton and Naor made a little bit better estimate, but you see it's better in the second, in the second thing. So it's not really improving anything. And it turns out that this constant logarithmic dependence cannot be improved. So there is a Talagran counterexample where you consider the functions on Hamming cube with values on functions with Hamming cube. Uh, so in other words, you should construct a certain interesting function of two variables, one on Hamming cube, another on Hamming cube, and invent a certain mixed metric in which it will not work, this inequality of Pizier, or rather it works, but with constant which grows like logarithm. And uh, he did it, Telegram, and uh, so it shows that you cannot improve uh, PCA inequality with constant independent of M. Um, by the way, about Telegram, maybe I should say uh, one word now. So recently, it turned out that the technique with which we did this in floor problem, uh, Ramon noticed that this technique solves also Telegram's conjecture. Uh, uh, if I have time, or if somebody will ask me if I don't have time, I will have a very short exp explanation what is Telegram conjecture. So it's also an old conjecture. It was solved in last year in 2020 by um, uh, L. Dunn and Gross. Uh, but the solution was like long and difficult. And Ramon noticed that from our main sort of lemma, you can make this proof like one page or something. So it also gives telegram conjecture. By the way, telegram conjecture has something to do with and flow in, in the following sense. And flow uh, works with this linear to nonlinear principle for Banach space valued functions on the Hamming cube. Uh, telegram conjecture uh, deals with uh, functions on the Hamming cube, which do not have like large image Banach space, but very small image, points zero and one. So telegram conjecture works with um, functions on the Hamming cube, which are Boolean function. And um, so, well, if I have time, I will tell you something about this. Well, anyway, telegram example, show that you cannot improve. So, and this raises the question, <clears throat> how to prove in flaws conjecture by bypassing telegram obstacle? Uh, maybe one needs to modify PZ inequality. Uh, and the second question, what is the exact class of Banach spaces for which in PZ inequality, you don't have dependence on N. So can one describe exactly this type of Banach spaces? So definitely not all Banach spaces because of Telegram counterexample, but maybe you can describe all of them. Okay, so <clears throat> this is what we did. So let me show you again Pizier inequality. So this is PZA inequality. Um, so here we have, uh, it's, it's all kind of Poincare inequality. So on the left, we have F minus average, then norm P, et cetera. And on the right, in, in Poincare, we should have something on the right with derivatives. So here are derivatives of function. And these guys are another sequence of independent Rademacher minus one, one, variables, okay? So this uh, E here is with respect to both sequence of Rademacher things, epsilon and delta, okay? So that was this year. So on the left, it's like in Poincare inequality. On the right, it's derivative as it's supposed to be in Poincare inequality and averaging over uh, both independent sequences, epsilon and delta. And both are just Rademachers. So this is what we did. So we consider uh, other things. So these are also 
guys, which has values plus or minus one, but these are not Rademacher. They're, they're like disbalanced Rademacher variables. So the probability is not one half, one half, but the probability is, is like that. The T is from zero to infinity. Um, and then we normalize them. So we consider like as it's supposed to be like a random variable minus average divided by square root of variance. And this delta will be important and they have the same name. They're also deltas, right? Like before, but they're delta I of T that depend on time. Um, and then it turns out that with the same left-hand side like in Poincaré inequality should be, uh, you have like sort of Pizier inequality, but you have one more average. So you, you write like Pizier inequality, but here you have these deltas depending on T, and then you average one more time with this T with some special probability measure on zero on, on half line. So, and by miraculous simple calculations, it then gives and flow conjecture. Very simple. Um, so le let me tell you three things. So first of all, why? H how we get that? When, when we were neighbors with, with Ramon in, the, in MSRI, the same office, um, I kind of, at this moment, I was very, 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 very interested. I don't know where is the slide. Yeah, here is the slide. I was very interested. Okay, this is Gaussian. This year, sharp constant. What if we do the same for Rademacher? So how about L1 Poincaré inequality on Hamming in Hamming cube. Well, this story has, has immense literature and everything. Uh, uh, I don't want to go there, it's many lectures. But uh, I want to say something. Um, there was, a, I, I think the first person who did it with some constant was Talagran, but it was long ago. But then uh, Francois Luce Picard proved this inequality but you see constant is different. It was square root of pi over two, now it's pi over two. And there was no sharpness, no example or anything. But the main thing about this Francois thing was not that there was no sharpness or anything, but it was that the method. So th this, is, this is an equality about functions on the very simple object on discrete cube functions with values not in Banach space, in real numbers. So to, to, to have this inequality, she used quantum random variables. So to prove this inequality, she made something absolutely amazing. I never saw it in my life that to prove some more or less elementary inequality, at least, at least it looks elementary, uh, about usual functions, you need to go to the quantum world. It was absolutely amazing. I, I was flabbergasted and I, I wanted to understand this proof and especially I wanted to improve this constant. And basically we started to talk about that and soon after leaving MSRI, we sort of found to improve this constant. And the improvement of this constant was not much. It was pi over two minus 10 to the minus 10. And of course we have no idea whether, I, we still believe that this is sharp uh, and of course, but we have no idea. But the method with which we did it is eventually brought this and flaws problem solution. So that's one thing I, I wanted to say. Um, so another is a theorem. We described completely the Banach spaces in which you have you can have constant not dependent on n, a universal constant, and uh, these are exactly uh, 
so-called Banach spaces of finite cotype. Uh, I, I explain what is type. Cotype is the opposite inequality when you estimate the average uh, or the Macher average from below, not from above. Um, and strangely enough, it was also a new result. So it's, uh, we, we have this thing. So again, I, 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 I'm still very astonished and flabbergasted by this fantastic use of quantum random variables in completely scalar problem. Okay. Uh, and well, it's our blame. It's, that's a bad thing to do. What we did, we took off quantum random variables. So we invented another proof, which is completely scalar and uses this lemma here, or theorem, uh, to make the constant better. Uh, and quantum variables disappeared. But then we started to move further with our research uh, about uh, such kind of inequalities uh, with Banach space valued functions and um, harmonic harmonic uh, simple integral operators on Hamming cube. And then we needed to put quantum variables back. But this I, I should skip. <coughs> so here are these quantum variables, but let's forget about them. I just want to say one word about Talagrad's conjecture. So oh, just maybe one word. It's a very exciting thing. So this is this, this is um, Poincaré inequality. It's uh, true. I mean, always. Basically, on on Hamming cube, it's always true, of course. And um, it, it is sharp. For 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 example, linear polynomials, it's it's sharp, but it's very non-sharp if your function has only two values. Uh, so for Boolean functions, something is wrong with Poincaré inequality. Uh, here I even give example uh, what, what, is, what is bad. Uh, the function we consider, the Boolean function is called majority. So it just counts the votes. How many people uh, say plus one, then we give a function one. And if majority give minus one, we give this function value minus one or zero, it doesn't matter. And for such function, the Poincaré inequality is very much off, especially if n is large. So something is wrong. Uh, and there is a famous theorem of uh, uh, this um, theoretical computer scientist, Khan uh, Kalai Lineal, or combinatorial, I don't know who, who they are, uh, which makes uh, Poincaré inequality better. To make Poincaré inequality better, you make constant in the left-hand side very large. And why it's very large? Because here is so certain thing which calls influence, and it's supposed to be small. Uh, it's not small like in Russia, because if function is dictator function, depends only on one variable, then influence of this variable is very large. But for normal voting functions, uh, influences are small for each variable. And so this, this guy here is small, so this constant is large. And so when you divide, it becomes small, so Poincaré inequality becomes much bigger, better. Uh, so the, the, the corollary of KKL theorem is the following, that if, even if you think that influence should, you should think that it's small, but it's bigger than you think. So, you see, this is the trivial Poincaré inequality and the right-hand side is the sum of influences. And if you take the maximum influence, it becomes bigger than one over n vari variance. It's triviality because the right-hand side is just sum of influences. There are n of them, take maximum, so divide by n, it's this, this is the inequality. But KKL says that it's bigger, that it's bigger than logarithm n divided by n. So somewhere they took this logarithm from, from, from I don't know where. I mean, I know, but 
There's no time to explain. And here is the corollary of this amazing theorem. So this is the amazing theorem. So this is one corollary that logarithms jumps out from somewhere. And here is very interesting corollary for democracy. So suppose you have a Boolean function, which is monotone. Uh, monotone is a very natural property of voting schemes. If more people vote for one, then, so if they have two things and one has more ones than another, then if the first had one as a value, then the second should have one at the value, okay? If more people voted for uh, uh, Biden, then it should be Biden. Okay, so uh, monotone and Boolean functions, we can call them voting function. And suppose its average is not minus one. Basically, it just means that it's not constantly minus one. Okay, so its average is slightly bigger than minus one. Then the candidate one, which with this average, well, chances to win not very well, not very good. Uh, this candidate one can bribe selected number, very small number of voters, actually this number of voters, and make the average very close to one. So that's kind of amazing result which follows from this improved Poincaré inequality on Boolean functions. Well, anyway, let's make it short. Here is the ultimate Poincaré inequality for Boolean functions. So that you cannot do better. And this was the conjecture of uh, Telegram that this inequality is right. Um, and it was open for a long time. And as I said, Eldan and Gross proved it in 2020, um, beautiful method. But Ramon noticed that it follows from us in two slides. So actually I don't have time, but this is the proof of Telegram's conjecture using the lemma which I uh, made in the middle of my talk, our lemma. So, um, so this, is, uh, this is it, this is what I wanted to say. And now maybe there are questions. Thank you. Any questions? So what is this quantum quantum world? So how does it? Quantum random variables. Yes. Yeah, well, it's, um, so, so it's, it's, it's the following thing. Um, it, it, what it is, is, is easy, but why, why it should be there? Yeah, why, why, it is, why it is relevant? So why it's relevant, it's not clear why, because well, what it is is the form. So, uh, let's uh, let, so we we deal with functions, right? Functions on Hamming cube. So these are just functions of n, where n is large, large, unlimited number, uh, epsilons, epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon. Um, so let's look at function epsilon one. It's just very simple linear polynomial, and it's a very simple function. Well, instead of thinking about it as a function. Let's think about it as an operator. So let's think about L infinity on Hamming cube as operators on L2 on Hamming cube. And very simple operators, just multiplication. Okay, so far it cannot be very serious, right? Not a big deal. But it turns out that our question, this estimate, for example, this Poincaré inequality, or oh, there are more serious estimates uh, which deal with uh, singular integrals on Hamming cube, they can be, um, so what you can do, you can formulate it in terms of this operators, which are so far just functions, they commute, they, everything is fine, but, you can introduce a certain strange algebra, a certain semi-group 
which throws your commutative objects into non-commutative world. So they're operators and they commute. So that still functions, but they lie in some very big object, which is say matrices of very large size, two to the n by two to the n. And of course matrices do not commute. So the proof goes like that. You uh, formulate your problem, you invent a certain way to throw them into the non-commutative world, uh, make certain, um, dynamics there. So well, sort of non-commutative heat semigroup and then project back into commutative world. And this amazing algebra allows you to get this estimate, this uh, pi over two of this, uh, of this uh, Francois Luce Picard uh, estimate comes from exactly this scheme. So this constant, for example. Uh, so before that, as I said, there was another sum constant, which was proved by Telegram without any operators, without any non-commutative guys. Um, then the Francois in, invented this amazing method, uh, push it forward to single integrals on, on, uh, on coming cube. And I was just hooked by the fact that it's just incredible to prove a scalar thing by, by this absolutely amazing method, which has formally nothing to do. So like conceptually, uh, it's one of the greatest paper I ever, ever read. Uh, and I, I'm sorry that we eliminated non-commutative random variables from it. So we found that commutative proof, which, which gives better constant. But, but the idea is still very powerful because when we started to push it forward to single integrals, we, we kind of ined inevitably came to this non-commutative stuff again. So here it was not needed, but if you consider more difficult inequalities, you, you again come back. And, and it's amazing. Uh, that we have nothing to say about constant except this. And uh, Ramon, who is very good with computers, as part of, by the way, uh, they made the experiments. Um, and you can, you, you see, you can, you can really try to compute what happens if your cube is not of very high dimension, like n equals two, three, eight points, four, 16 points. Uh, and and then you can compute this constant precisely because you can just go through all possible Fs and, and see what happens. And the graph is amazing. So it has long steady uh, places where this constant is the same, right? Then it jumps again, long steady, then it jumps, but then N becomes like 14 and computer starts to not working because two to the 14 is, you, you, you should work with matrices two to the 14 by two to the 14. It's a little bit too much for, for the computer. But if you look at the graph and extrapolate, it, it looks like that you will get the sharp constant when N is equal to 60. Well, two to the 60 times two to the 60 matrices is probably even super, super computer can improve, so. And, uh, which, which is very interesting because central limit theorem becomes central limit theorem for n equals, uh, I think, eight. We don't need 60. Thank you. So any other questions? Well, I guess, uh, thank you again, yeah. No, thank you very much, that was terrific. <laughs> very thank impressive. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Could you send the slide?